Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Explicit Measures podcast with Tommy, Seth, and Mike. That was the most boring intro ever. Good, wow. good, good morning. Good, good, mor- good morning, everybody. Thank you for <laughs> Happy Tuesday. Oh, wow. Happy Tuesday, oh, gentlemen. Geez, Get a little raspy on that one. <laughs> and, and all the things. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the Explicit Measures podcast. That's pretty good. You know what? We should pretty we should good. probably hire someone to actually like after when we hit episode two hundred, we'll get a real intro in here. Yeah. And we'll have someone with a really deep voice. I keep telling you, like, yeah. oh, you want to go? You want to go way? Deep. Yeah, I want. Uh, you I know, got like, a guy in, in, a, in a world where there is nothing but data. In a world. Yeah, like, something like that. I think that would be good go to have like a little bit more. Several octaves mm-hmm. lower. Yep, exactly. Go along with it. Dun, 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 Maybe we should get a new theme song. I don't know. Th- throw throw, throw us in the chat in the comment. Do you have the theme, new theme song? I want a shot at this. Uh, yeah, I want to throw my hat in the mix. All right. The mix in the hat. Something. Let's yeah, do that. That works. I'll be down. All right. For those who are listening to the podcast live, we're apologizing. We're going to apologize. This is a pre recorded episode. I will also note, though, this is an evening for us when we record these, and we get a little bit punchy. So, slightly, listeners beware. This could get interesting. I, I'm curious, or, or about enjoy, the audio listeners, you know. like you know what a podcast is supposed to be. Just listen for a, a new episode. I wonder if they're like, why are they always talking about the stupid live? Because I feel like that's <laughs> we have a lot of lives. people who just listen yeah, to the just, audio. That's alone true. That are that's not true. Live, and we're always yeah. focused on our live audience. We love the live audience. We love but all there's a lot of people who just listen like on their morning. Yeah, commute. but they listen for the first five minutes, get our jokes in, and they're like, all right, I'm I the have world. the numbers, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> they're avid, avid listeners. Some would call them are champions. They, are they really listening or are they just in there to chat yeah. amongst each other? You know, we're helping I, I don't you know, know, we're helping you wash the dishes. We're helping you go for a walk. We're helping you like yeah, you all go. the things that you should I should be doing that I don't do. So I'm helping comment, you do those things. Com- comment. Do you do you like the pre-recorded? punchy episodes from the evening or is it the morning episode eh, eh, eh. i like I it or if you're an audio listener we want to hear from you i, I don't know <laughs> that's who i was talking to oh, oh. The morning He's listeners like, are going to be like no man night so i don't i show night? up i sh- right now they're, they're going to be the ones that are like i showed up at 7 30 and you're not even here and now i'm upset <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we aim oh, to my- disappoint I would, yeah. I would be interested. Our I goal interested. is, lo- our, our bar is low. We have a low bar here at Explicit Measures. <laughs> Tough to have a bar, yeah. So let's do some. Is that let's a do a quick or horizontal. Bar? Like, uh... <laughs> it's definitely a bar chart. Yeah, it's definitely it a bar chart. Been flow or <laughs> here at Explicit Measures, we enjoy pie charts. That's what that's our favorite thing that we like oh, to do my here. Gosh. All right, I uh, talk to you guys later. <laughs> we're done now. Clearly, this is a night episode because we're talking about pie charts again. So <laughs> let's They're do not some that quick... bad. They're actually well, not as bad for their context. If there's a if there's an actual use case with the data, if you have an 80-20 kind of It was rule, a joke, Tommy. Well, I'm just saying, <laughs> we always talk about pie charts when they're really not that bad. It's shallow, the shallow view. Oh, boy. Talk this is going to be a, a future episode. Right. Why Tommy likes pie charts. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get some intros in here very briefly. We've been pushing this pretty hard, and I hope you, you guys are going to enjoy this one. Uh, we have the SQL Bits Conference coming up on March 14th through 18th. Uh, you can visit SQLbits.com to go visit the website and learn more about the conference. You can get a 5% discount by using Power BI Tips 5 to get into the conference. Tommy will be there. Tommy will be a uh, personality at the SQL Bits conference. So go say hi to Tommy. Give him a big hug. Um, we'll have him all swagged out with you know Power BI Tips and the explicit measures stuff. So make sure you give Ooh, him a hard time. You heard it the here. Personality also count as a speaker. It's like, no, I'm just going to be personally there. No, you're going to be. He's yes. a personality that's speaking. From, from, personality yeah. who's also speaking. Yeah, on exactly. metrics, actually. Oh, yeah. yes. So, the most developed product that Tommy has observed over the last couple months. So this Congratulations, is... by the way, Tommy. I don't know if we've actually, like, getting into SQL bits. It's hard. It's a big deal, man. Like, they had it was a, mistake. Like, a whole video. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what they we need an Italian in here. Yeah. His name's Puglia. <laughs> this is, this is his one and only they, try. They, they can't like, d- cut they, the meat here. He's going to be out. You know, the only you, time know, gonna ask. you know there was some discontent or a lot of people wanted to speak there when they do like a follow-up tweet, Twitter video, like whole here's our process of how, of selection, et cetera. There's a lot. Of, it's a premium co- conference, man. So congratulations. It's a, it's a I big did deal. The, I, I made the mistake of 
buying the plane ticket and the hotel and then i looked again at the agenda just to make sure i'm reading everything <laughs> <laughs> Did I misread that I am. I'm speaking? pretty sure I am, but this sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Excellent. There's also another event if you don't want to travel all the way over to London, or I guess you would be in the. Wales. It's actually in Wales. ICC Wales is where it's technically at in the UK. Um, if you want to go to a Power BI virtual summit, there's a Power BI virtual summit happening from March 6th to 10th. It is the Global Power BI Summit.com. This is run by Reza Rad and, and Radicad. Love those guys. Great training. Lots of good resources and very uh, much a part of the community. Rez is, I don't know, a 20 time MVP. I mean, he's got so many MVP awards. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. He has more MVP. My kids are younger than his number of MVPs. I think that's how that works. I think, I think yeah. if there's an award that Microsoft gives, Reza has it. He's got it. He's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, love yeah. his stuff. He's top notch. He hosted a conference here in Chicago. Absolutely loved it. I thought it was super fun. He did an incredible job uh, putting it on and it ran super smooth. So kudos mm -hmm. to Reza. If you want to visit him, go check out. Global Power BI Summit. It is virtual, so you can attend from anywhere. Just got to carve out some time. And we will all be speaking. We'll all be personalities on that event. So we will be there. What's, uh, what's great about that attending. Uh, event to, to note, right, is they run the sessions twice, right? Yes. Depending on what time zone you're yep. in, you'll yes. always be able to catch a session, which I, I love. It's a great idea. Globally, it literally could be watched anywhere in the world. They're going to they're try and... Uh, to accommodate both sides. And if and if you're just, you know, can't catch it during the day, you can catch it at night. So if you, mm -hmm. whatever time works best for you. All right, excellent. That's enough for the announcements. Uh, let's talk about some more great articles. I feel like every other day we're mentioning, uh, it's Kurt Bueller, right? Is that how you? Bueller. Yeah. <laughs> when you're mentioning him every other day. I'm good <laughs> at names, right? That's, oh boy. I just go, I just say it's Kurt. It's Kurt's blog. Kurt. So Kurt does an amazing job. He is the, the ideas behind data goblins. And so like always, like clockwork, man, he comes out with some just dynamite, really well-written articles. And today we're diving into two of those articles. I believe part one and part two are out. Part three has not made it yet. Watch watch part three make it out before we hit this episode and, and launch it. So, you know, stay tuned. Part <laughs> so three out. we'll only be two thirds of the way there. We'll be only two, maybe oh. we'll have to come a, a follow up here. But we're talking about uh, building learning Power BI with sample data sets. And so um, we will put the links in the description of the video so you can go follow those links, read up on them. It's actually quite of a long article. He does a good job of explaining like what are the concepts and then does a good job explaining how to execute on um, getting started with creating data sets that you could learn on top of. So what are you guys thoughts on kind of the, the idea of creating or finding, have, I mean, this is a core thing that I do a lot. I actually go hunting for data sets or data things that are easy to consume. Um, Seth and I actually built a number of layouts that we sell and give away for free on the website, uh, powerbi.tips. And by doing that, we were like, oh man, it'd be really smart for us to have like a common data set across all of these. So that way, no matter what we're building, there's like a, a, a pattern. And something is, there's something to making sure that you understand the data set especially if you're trying out something new. So if you know what the numbers are going to try and how the data structure works, it's much it's much easier to build something new or test something out when you actually understand the data structure before you'd start to build something brand new, like a new feature from Power BI Desktop. So anyways, let's get into the topic. What do you guys think? I, I mean, we're obviously huge advocates of learning by doing, right? 100%. Like, <laughs> It is fundamentally one of the ways where you catalog things in your own library that you can mm -hmm. apply to different um, scenarios as opposed to just solving a problem for your particular scenario right away. Mm -hmm. But there's work, right? It, especially the like invested. With, right. Like, so we, depending on how you're ingesting the information, there's, if you're reading um, a book and the book doesn't come with supplemental data or mm -hmm. somebody didn't prepare it for you there there's work to be done to create your own thing and it's fantastic if you can find your own data set or like find something that you're interested in which also has a data set that you can conform like pull in mm -hmm. which you can digest which you can break down and i think that's where like the whole idea a long time ago by the way right microsoft came up with the contoso database right which this fabricated system of data that was more than just a table 
which is kind of what you get in the Power BI desktop, right? Like the the um, simplified format of some some sample data, but it doesn't get into the, the big weeds. So like, I love the fact that he took an old data set and literally like makes that like, yeah, there's work to do to actually like put this together to start my learning into this article of like, hey, here, here's how you do this, boom, boom, which I've seen before. I've seen many articles of like, here's the Contoso database, here's how you connect to it, here's how you create your SQL server. But like even in the first article, which we'll talk about, like at the end, it's just, what are the questions? Like it makes it mm. so BI specific. I like where, that. Yes. Where I, I'm I'm drawn in. It's like, it's not an, it's not an old data set anymore right like it there's meaning behind this all of a sudden it's like you can all of a sudden like i get excited about the data set again because he he has spent time to analyze it to a level where like you're making meaning out of um a learning data set which is just going to help you accelerate into all these other areas so i'm probably going way further than i need to but like setting up the idea it's fantastic he uses an old data set and guides us through a, a great process of making it meaningful to us. Um, and I, I think to leverage for a, a lot of different learning learning things that we wanna do. And great balance here, because for me, it, it's all about the second article, which is using personal data. And I think the skills that you acquire here are all about context, because using a sample data set or using your company's or client's data set, it's all fine and well, but until you use something that's important to you, that's going to shape what you're going to display. I cannot tell you how many times I, I use from my own consulting firm or I've used for from a baseball point of view uh, and look at like trying to build the model, which is fine. But then like, wait, this is not important to me right now. I need to modify the uh, the visuals. I've been doing that with our own podcast numbers going. Uh, I, I was experimenting with something, but then going in and to actually say, okay, what's going to actually help me make a decision or get insight out of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't know that until it's important or it affects you and understanding being under the microscope is so different than just dealing with someone's question or statement on what's important to them. As and a personal consumer. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you were done. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Go I was going to say, Tommy, as, as a personal consumer of your reports, the first thing I get hung up on is the colors. It's, always, it's never on brand. It's never with the tips brand. It, no, I'm just teasing you. Cause I was about to say, it's the sandbox face. It's sandbox. If you, really, sandbox. If you really felt. And actually, I have built the power grid. Yes. <laughs> yes. So when I first saw your reports, it's kind of eh, bad. <laughs> eh. It could use a scrim, maybe a layout, you know, some, some organization would be, would be very much appreciated. No, I'm just teasing. They're actually really, really good. And um, it, so I would agree with you hundred percent, Tommy, like um, there is, but I think some of the points in the article that Kurt points out are some of the challenges when you work with yeah. personal data sets. Like yeah. he has a note in here that says, if you're working with, this is on article two, basically, if you're working with a personal data set, unless you're really committed to the outcome of that data set, mm -hmm. sometimes you get about halfway through it and you're like, Ugh, that's not really what I was thinking. Shoot. And I, I do think personal data sets are great. Even looking at like, there's a lot of great source. And the best part in the article, he lists out you can go get stuff from Spotify, from Netflix, Twitter, LinkedIn, and he tells you how to go get those personal datas. And so I think that's really interesting. And I, I also agree, if you care about the data, it does have like a little, oh, that's interesting. I never knew about that, my listing habits. Or I never knew how many songs I consume each day. Oh, look, you know, 9 a.m. is the most consumed time I have when I look at it data stuff. I mean, we have a website, looking at our I personal think, website and thinking yeah. through those things is huge. I think I think that's one of the biggest challenges I've had and and probably others engaging with Contoso or just a generic data set. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it also outlines the difference between just providing somebody data without them understanding the business behind it. Yes. Right? Or what are the the insights that we're looking for in mm -hmm. that data? And that's where I love like he actually lays out cases for different things where it's like, you know, in, in the first one, the blog, right? A full breakdown of how do you get this into a SQL server? How yep. do you, how do you leverage Contoso? Why do you want to do this thing? Why do you want to become familiar with the components of, of setting up the infrastructure? But then right away follows that with, 
this is this is meaningful. It's supposed to be meaningful. So here's some some use cases. Of Business how case you use cases. Go, yeah. go about looking at the data, yeah. which automatically draws me as a user into it and being like, I'm with you now, Kurt. <laughs> like, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And well, I, and I love that section there. Yeah. Yeah. I I think he's actually, in my opinion here, he's following a bit of the best practice here. Right. One getting mm -hmm. the data is half the problem. The yeah. other half the problem is framing out the right questions for the right audience. And these are two things that we use as a technique. And Seth, you and I developed this when we were working on reports together, right? One is like, know your audience. First thing he lets you know, business case one, hey, we're the VP of a European division. Already you know summary level metrics, higher level aggregations. We already identify who the audience is. And then it talks about when does this person need this report? By what and what kind of information? And then it walks through the questions, right? Here are the key metrics you need to understand how to calculate them. And here are the questions you're trying to answer. This is a pattern you should follow no matter what you're doing, yeah. whether it's personal, report, business. And I like the idea he's setting up a good, a good healthy pattern of thinking through the questions. And these are questions you should answer. And then he has another whole section around, here's other requirements or information you would want to think about. And he has additional considerations. So I really thought this was very well set up. And at the very end, he starts talking about like your task. Okay, your task is to do this thing. So that gives you like a, a practical walk away that takes that data, gets it done. And then now you have a report you have to produce that meets that objective. I thought it was really smart. No, and that's a huge part. And I think that's this is a bit of the soft skills where if you've never been a stakeholder before for a report, it's very hard to have that empathy as a report builder. And understanding, and I, I can't tell you how many times, honestly, myself, I've been caught, uh, um, caught, we'll say naked in the sense of I'm building a report with personal data, not, you know, but um, figuratively, and, yeah, figuratively speaking, and I'm building a report and I build it, I put the visuals, I connect all the data, mo the model, and I'm like, this report's telling me nothing. And it's um, data that's important, like it is personal yeah. data, yep. whether, again, whether it's, um, uh, you sleep an average of seven hours a night. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, okay but that's not what, like, I, what am I going to do with this? I'm like, I, and I'm now I'm not looking at that yes. report. I'm like, my gosh, this is what I keep claiming. Yeah. So that modification, this is, I mean, if there's ever a time to go, wow, what do I need to think about first before just building? Yes. And that's a huge <clears throat> component of here. So I'd, I'd rephrase kind of what you said, but I, I it's right on, in line with it, right? Where people have never been a stakeholder. Mm -hmm. And what I love about the three part section, right? It's like, first it's, here's your metrics. And most straight developers or people who are building reports, like, great, you just gave me the thing I need to go. No, I'm gonna go build this thing. But then it's followed up with questions, which also like help with the requirements. There should be an answer to each one of these things. This could be a requirement, right? These are the questions we need to answer. But then he dives into like the other requirements, like, you should be out in front of this this VP. Like, here's some other things that you should be thinking about. The executive doesn't like clicking around too much. They want to be able to see what's going on at a glance. Like, I think what I like about this scenario is one of the biggest things, and, and I'm not going to say lack, that it's not lacking. I think what, what I'm trying to say is one of the biggest challenges from doers like folks that just get a request or a requirement, they crank it out, right? But they're not thinking about the larger problem itself and enhancing it with the potential of like, how do I solve the larger problem? Like, are the requirements provided to me in this detail and what we're giving to this executive actually answering their problems like completely? Or are there other things that in a conversation, I pick up on right where all these yes. other requirements like, like these like yep. 10 or 15 extra yeah. bullets of like hey i gave you the calculations hey i gave you the questions but there's a whole bunch of this other stuff right yep. and it, it what that does i think in this context and what should be happening to individuals as they work on things is there's a larger context to this request and it's not always as simple as like here you have the 10 bullets the 10 bullets are going to solve the 10 things and then mm -hmm. everybody's going to be happy there's always nuance there's always communication gaps and it, like free thinking in a business is actually a good thing 
if you're if you're keyed in and you're paying attention. And it's, but it's also one of the hardest gaps, I think, of elevating people who are so used to just execution into actually thinking about how you can benefit the business with just a little bit extra thought and like mm-hmm. solution building on your own. And what would probably surprise them is how far that extra solution building goes. I like I like to your point there. So I thought that was very good pickup on the other requirements. Like some examples here, he talks about in Europe the bill the billing date is where this report's being based out of. In Europe, the billing date is always the next working day after the delivery date. Oh man! So now you've right. got to start shifting numbers from weekends to a Monday. And right. oh, by because the way, if you provided those numbers beforehand, it wouldn't mean yeah. anything. It wouldn't mean, right? yep. You'd lose the meaning. Yep, exactly right. So like there, there is some business rules and, and it sounds it, to me also, it sounds like Kurt is pulling from some prior knowledge around some of these requirements that this is something that was given to him or maybe he had worked on something similar in nature and kind of was able to extrapolate some other project requirements into this one. So I thought this was really very well done. Well, the tectonic shift for me uh, when I started dealing with personal data or things that I really wanted to act on was not so much that the data, like when I was building out the visuals and the metrics was what am I really trying to act on here? And I would constantly be updating the report because I'm like, this is fine, but I, I need it to be cer- laid out a certain way or show a certain thing because I need, I want to make a decision here. And that was the shift where now I look at any scoping or any project and I'm trying to think, really think, get into those shoes of well, what are they really going to be acting on looking at this? Not just answering a question because the, 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 the common cause of like, what, what is something happened in the last 12 months, right? Or the, the rolling six months. That's fine. But I don't look at my data over the rolling six months. If it's not honestly, like I can think of three examples right now of personal reports that I have, I'm like that doesn't really tell me anything next week. So what do I need right now that is going to help me, whether it's with, fr- again, whether it's from the podcast point of view, whether it's from my own consulting point of view, or when I'm looking at, honestly, like baseball stats, like what am I trying to actually communicate from here? And that's right. been the, the <laughs> largest shift. Um, I, I do want to ask a question, though, here, where because we've talked about learning and learning by doing, reading, researching, uh, essentially on this, and we, we continue to talk about learning. Um, it's a constant battle and journey that we're all going on, but what do you get by learning by doing that you can't in any other of the plat in a sense of the avenues of learning like, again, from reading or watching mm. videos. So what, what uh, from a, from a technical skills, we'll say, because well, I think we've really covered the soft skills. First and foremost, if you're ever interviewing with Seth and Mike <laughs> at any point in time in life, you better be a doer because the first thing we're going to ask you in an interview is pull open desktop, go get some data and make me a measure or two and build a chart like live in the interview. Like it's like, an, it's like, show me what you're doing because I, I think the, the, one of the more telling experiences when people tell me they know how to do power BI, if I ask you to do it and you can't load the dummy data set from desktop, if you can't make a handful of measures, if you can't make a relationship between some tables or do a little yeah. bit of if you're not even knowing where to click on the buttons for some of this stuff i'm already throwing some skepticism against your direction so one of these things is in a doing area if someone ever does push you in an interview ever someone ever is watching you drive through desktop right the doing exercise is building that muscle memory it's making you it's forcing you to really think through the steps of what you're actually doing yeah you could read about it I think that could get you a lot of the way there. But for me, again, I'm a person, I'm a doer. Like you said, Seth, like kind of earlier, like you, you're a doer. I want to get my hands on it. I want to make my mistakes. And I want to learn from that stuff. That, that's how I like to learn. But that's just my personality. Other people may learn different ways. Insider's hint. If you get an interview with Mike and you say, there's no tablet editor, I can't work on this. He'll hire you on the spot. Hire you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> on on the spot like, hey, like hey i'm currently hiring you want to <laughs> like like but put, put your resume but in the part, chat below because no, seth would part, like to know about part your resume of, part part of like I, I shouldn't say part part of our loop the orig- the first part of our loop is a technical exercise like that yep you'd, mm-hmm. you'd be it's shocked be there. how many people don't get through the first loop which is yep. doing right like show hey I have some really simple questions like open the desktop, connect to these things, write this measure, 
right? And if you're saying that you're, you have years of experience doing something and you can't easily go through that, it, I'll just say it's a challenge. Anyway, to your question, doing, why is it important? I think, I think, and I'm going to step outside my comfort zone here. I think there's actually a like scientific reason why like your brain imprints things differently when you actually work through the problem as opposed to reading it or, yep. or just like that. ingesting it in a video or by, by word. <clears throat> and like, because of that, it becomes part of your library in your head to the point where um, it becomes like what I would term true knowledge versus theoretical, right? Because true, when I've gone through and actually practiced something, when I'm when I encounter problems in the future, I know I have a solution for it. I just got to find where it was, right? right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to theoretical, it there's nothing to apply it to. I didn't I didn't work through anything. I didn't it didn't challenge me in any way, and I forget about some of those things I might, I might have just read about. Um, one of the best ways I learned Power BI. And I would I I just talked to one of my <clears throat> my folks this last week because they were interested in like hey um I want to I want to learn more about Power BI like what how what do I focus on and I pulled up like my blog article of 2019 from the Matrix right okay. just hey here's the Matrix like some Still ideas matrix. of like all the spectrum yep. of skills in Power BI and where would you rate yourself and she was like oh like around a 4.5. But she went and bought, and I'm like, one of the best things, if DAX is your thing, go buy the definitive guide to DAX and start working through that. And if that's your, like, your focus, hardcore interest area. But in terms of like the spectrum of Power BI, one of the best places I learned by practically doing was the community. Yeah. Like I can go out and I can read technical jargon. I can solve my own business problems. But when you get thrown into the community of many other people asking very specific questions about their specific business problems, it it flips a switch in your head and you go and solve those problems by literally internet sleuthing or looking at books or like, and it imprints in you in different ways that I think you start to like build this repertoire of problem solving across the spectrum of a tool that just makes you invaluable. And I think that is significantly different than somebody writing a book that says, here's the basics of Power BI, you go read it, and then you know everything about Power BI without any practice. I'd also argue too, some of these red sources about Power BI, Power BI is changing very fast. The colors are changing, the icons are changing. I was on a report, uh, a mess, uh, meeting today, the icons that I had were different than what they had because I had something turned on in the service that were previewing new features and new icons and seeing what I clicked on to uh, drive adoption. Like there's just all kinds of weird stuff that Microsoft's doing, like to make sure that the, the product is the best product it can, it can be. Great. I'm I'm loving that. I mean, that's great. But without without those written areas, sometimes there's gaps in there. And there's sometimes things like the the product will physically change things like very early on in Power BI. You could just load a flat file and it would just load the file. Well, now when you load a, a file from a folder, you get this whole automatic function that appears. Like they changed fundamentally how the program works. And sometimes you just need some hands-on time to make sure you learn how that works. Uh, I, I can't, before, before I say my statement, Seth, when you said that you're going to go out of your comfort zone, 20% of me went, oh my gosh, Seth is going to sing. So... I have no problem singing. What do you want me to say? Okay. Well, it's, it's not out of your comfort zone. <laughs> but, my comfort zone? <laughs> well, I think con honestly, um, and also use this, um, uh, constantly we are dealing with the same data models and the same projects. So yeah, they are obviously shifts, but what, what the sample data sets or our own personal data really forces us to do. And I, I really do equate it to like a carpenter or someone who loves working on house projects where it's always going to be, uh, a new, there's always some complication or some scenario like, oh, I wasn't expecting this. Now I have to pivot. Now I have to think differently. For example, my wife is loves doing house projects. I hate them, but I love dealing with new data sets or new data models and trying to figure out like, what's the solution here? And, uh, and that's a huge part. And I really equated the same way because I can see her mind tinker when like we're, we're putting up a wall this weekend. She's like, okay, I have to measure this. Okay. Now we have to 
change this up. And it's so similar to when I'm dealing with a new data model or new scenario yep. um, when it comes to the data. And it's like, okay, well, what are they trying to do? Well, maybe this could work. And you have to apply not just the knowledge, but the experience and then try it out and see if it works. Yeah. And that to me is the best way to like, uh, from the learning point of view. I'm going to coin a term here that I'm not sure is even, I've never heard it before, but I'm going to just, I'm going to go out of my comfort zone and use a new word here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wandering have, this trial. No, sorry. Have, have you guys ever run into what I'm going to call report dil disillusionment? Disillusionment. So I had to go Google the word while you guys were talking to make sure I had the right definition of the doggone word. Disillusionment. The feeling of disappointment from a resulting discovery that something was not as good as what you believed it to be. Report disillusionment, I think, is a real thing. And I, for me, I've pulled out a couple personal data sets that I've worked on and thought, I'm going to stitch this data together. I'm going to get this amazing graph. And I build something in my, like, I've kind of roughed out a, you know, a sketch of what I think the report should do. And then I get out all the data, I put it on a bar chart, and it's like a flat <laughs> there's like no change it's like straight bars all the way across like this is great this was not it's, helpful i was hoping like a couple categories would be like yeah. higher higher ranked <laughs> than others so i have like this is, like a, like this letdown of like uh and is that is that report disillusionment or is it actually like your assumption of the data <laughs> maybe like, it's my data maybe your reality is so distorted point, where you're though. like i'm gonna prove my wife wrong and then you're like <laughs> nope <laughs> I have not true. seen the increase <laughs> that I oh thought. Oh my gosh, she's always right in the data too. Son of <laughs> <laughs> she's right in the data. Yes, exactly. But that's so I, I think that's a thing because sometimes we talk about like, and I've I've also heard people like communicate about. Uh, so I've encountered this in some of my personal data sets. I've also heard t people talk about this, and as I'm ideating with them about like, you know, we have to be a little bit flexible when we're building reports with people because the data you think you're bringing to the visual, yes, in in theoretical term to your point seth in theoretical terms yeah i could totally put these two metrics together or i could totally have a bar chart here instead of a line chart what that would make sense and here's the insight i'm trying to show you know month over month percent change in sales great and then you look at the chart and go we didn't really get much change month over month or but, the change is so wild that i can't see any there's no yeah. metrics in here or but, the difference in the bars are so minimally like eh, it's not really valuable but what you're outlining, I think, is one of the, one of the powers of Power BI, right? Like you have Correct. an assumption. Yes, you're you pivot. Putting together a data set, pivot to analyze it, pivot to mm -hmm. to analyze it, and the outcome the is right not state. what you assumed, right? Like yeah. so, you're adjusting your worldview based on the data, as opposed mm -hmm. to just carrying forward that misconception, that mis yes. misassumption, and yep. I think that. That is a perfect example of why we talk about data culture and raising data awareness because so much of decision making in business is based on assumptions yes. instead of data. And like that is a perfect example on like in, in any level of why insights are important around data because you come you can come to it with an assumption, you bring in the data, and then you're like, wait a minute. That doesn't look right. Well, or, that's minute. right. And I'm like, wait a minute. Power, I think yeah. that that we deal with and why we're so comfortable with data showing us the right thing is because we come at it with a an open mind, mm -hmm. even though we might have a preconceived notion like, oh, this is absolutely going to show me like this massive spike and it's just like, boop. Yep. Like, dang well, it. Hmm. What does that mean? As opposed to, right. yes. I think many people who are like, well, this is how it is don't change my mind <laughs> and this looks nice yeah <laughs> like well yeah. sorry dude but that's not what it is that's what right? the data well, says yeah yeah and to me the heart of the matter is like what are we trying to do i'll, I'll give a pretty uh specific example um every year for the last five years i've done this over under baseball bet with a, a bunch of buddies and basically we pick how many wins someone's gonna get and every every gay every day it tracks if it's how close it is to that number. And the first time I built this report that I, I would share with them. Tommy like, always won because he built the report. Yeah, no, I have not won yet. So, <laughs> actually, so. 
That's why we don't do betting. I don't charge. Uh, it's for, called a I don't, modifier. It's I don't a charge for modifier. over under. That's for, funny. For, I don't charge for money lines. Yeah. <laughs> My parameter <laughs> seems to yeah. always adjust to make sure the report yeah. makes that I win yeah. every time. What is this, and, uh, uh, what is this TP variance? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> TP percentage. Yeah, TP plus. Um, but I, I like it. Everything adjusted as I was looking at it because, like, if you're if you're a month into the season, there's a hundred games to go. Like, well, what would cause me to go back to look at it? And it, it, it forced me to think of like, well, what am I trying to communicate here or to say, Oh, something's mm -hmm. going to change or may change. Yeah. And basically forcing you to look at the inside, not just like, what's the question I'm asking, yeah. but what do I need to communicate? So I, I basically built it a way where every week it was like, Oh, you know, like something's changing here. And you, mm -hmm. it was actually visible. It forced me to make metrics to do that. It forced me to change the model to do that. And of course the layout, because again, unless you are in that position of what am I really trying to do? Not just put a bar chart together, but, and to what Kurt said, like, me, what are you trying to measure? And I think it goes back to that. Like he is talking about the social, what do you, what social media platforms you use the most? If you're looking at personal data, Correct. Well, how do you quantify right. the most? Yeah. And I love that so much when we're talking about that, because doing that exercise forces you to rethink how you're going to do the model, forces you what transformations you're going to do and forces you to what DAX you're going to apply. So yes. you're really using all of those muscles. Yeah. And I, and I liked Kurt's second article when he starts talking about the personal data, because it's messy. There's going to yeah. be. Yeah. errors in the data it's going to be a bit weird there's not it's not going to be as clean as a contoso data set which is like right. literally manufactured data like that, that column will always have a number in it and it'll, within a certain range it'll give you a number that makes reasonable sense and that's what it's that's what it's designed to do it's designed to do those very narrow like cleaned areas and you may not have that you may act i mean if you think about the business projects you work on i was in a call recently and it the challenge came up and my challenge is all the time I refresh my data set and it sometimes breaks. Oh, really? What's your data source? Well, we're pulling stuff from Excel. Ah, aha. <laughs> Excel is a great tool, but it also allows a lot of wide variety of data to go in there and people are crafty and they will put I mean, data in columns I mean, that does not need to be there. That? Oh, at least, uh, at least 150. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. We have 150 people potentially putting crap into my column. So like, the, the level of... Like the the less clean the data source is, the more work you have to do to protect your data set against failures because yeah, stuff so will break it. So you have to like I, you yeah. do more work there. It it'll be interesting where he goes with the third article, but like it, the way I the way I see this right is in the Contoso right. It, it's a data set that is curated one hundred percent by Microsoft. Been out there for oh, a so you're going but with he add, but he adds a personal touch to it where it's a yep. case study. Hey, sure. Here's cases, here's things, how you can analyze the data to make it meaningful. Second blog article is all about like, okay, now that you've you've had this perfect curated data set, right? Now, Mike, to your point, when you were outlining, I have this assumption, right? I Correct. have a personal data set that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. I, I probably have some preconceived questions or things I want to analyze about it, but it's not going to be as pretty or easy mm -hmm to like collect the data and I'm going to probably have to go through a bunch more shaping and shifting to get to a point where I can use it. And then is it going to output results that I would assume it would is, is the open question. There's a lot more work involved. I think that he outlines as far as like different data sets that people could potentially use if they were interested, but there is a lot of that like in between realm. Right. And I think <clears throat> that's where, some comments that both of you made around experience come into play, right? Mm -hmm. Where we've gone through this process so many times. Like I bought my son Pokemon cards for Christmas. Like, and it was like, Hey man, how interested are you in like understanding like what cards you have? <laughs> Statistics. Right? Here we're going to yeah. go. We're going to shoot. Should, should we build a report? <laughs> you know, that this is going right. Like, yeah. I know where you this start, is going. you start thinking about, right. All the columns, mm -hmm. all the, pieces of data i would need yep. to like start cataloging i love it what what he has in his hand that's awesome <laughs> what he wants that to trade for the cards yet no no right? yet. hold on no, yeah. no 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 because no. you track it because you, you want to open wanna... the packs kid yep and then just give me give me the stack and we'll we'll start cataloging oh, in excel yeah what i'm saying is like because you want to build experience. a deck that has the right number yeah. of characters <laughs> well, and like yeah hey kid go 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 uh go trade for this one 
This, this, <laughs> yeah. like, you have five of these. You have five of these. Go trade Funny. like three, three of them for this one. You're missing one thirty four. Mm -hmm. right? Like that's mm -hmm. the one you're after. It's uh, such and such, right? Strategic. So like, what what do I have? What is on the Pork site? Have a disadvantage you know, for the whole good. spectrum, right? Of course they do. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but the but the thing is, is like this is the growth of experience of working with many different data sets, oh. not only in business, but also playing around by myself, right? And this is what teaches, I think, people to start to think about building these models with unknown things, right? And you can, there's applications everywhere, but I think what it does a great job of is it starts to peel people out of people telling you to do something, right? Mm -hmm. I hammered on this earlier, but it's like, yep. you have your database and this is all the reporting you do out of this database. And it's like, no, man, there's a whole spectrum, a whole spectrum out here. And when you start to think about these randomized data sources yep. and start to organize and structure them in ways that you know you can start to gain and build insights from is where you start to gain a lot more knowledge and build your library of usefulness that, like extends beyond just what you know from a business perspective. So let me ask this, how are you going to be successful dealing with your personal data? Because I think just downloading your personal data does not guarantee success here. So let me ask you guys, what are some of the things that you would want to identify as these are, you have your personal data or your sample database, but how do you know you're actually going to acquire some skills or really have an advantage there? Well, I, I think, I mean, part of this is you have to kind of lean on some of the experience of others. Like, I think Kurt does a great job of saying, here's some data sources that are already public and available, and you can go get your data. Where well, there's some laws and government acts that say you can go get your information. One of my one of my biggest complaints with a lot of this is, I hate flat files, period. I just hate them. I don't like working with them. I think they're stupid. Like, it's just, it's just annoys me. So when I'm thinking about doing these activities, I'm always trying to like, I added, I added an unnecessary layer of complication because I'm like, oh, is there an API for this? Oh, I can get a token. Uh -huh. Let's write that in there. Like, so I'm always like trying to like, because I want, because my thing is I'm trying to be as lazy as I possibly can. If I get the, if I'm going to do the work to get the data, I, I want it to literally be a refresh button or just have this thing just kind of keep chewing and, you know, just keep refreshing the data. I just want to see the number change. That's all I want to see. So if I don't have something like that automated to that level, I'm like, hmm. I know it's throwaway work for me. Like I'm, I'm not going to go out and go out to a website and go continually get an Excel file or download a, a CSV all the time. I will, however, this is another challenge to that, to that data set level, Tommy, you're talking about. In cases where I go get a sample data set, I'm just trying to explore data. I will not edit or modify the data anymore inside Excel. I have thrown that out. So every time I'm trying, if I'm getting data from anything else, I'm trying to explore what's in the data set. I will no longer go get it from, uh, I won't open it up in Excel and start manipulating. I just don't do that anymore. My first step now is always go right to Power Query. And it's it's a two-part reason why I do this. Part one is that if I ever want to pull it again, I can just replace the file, it works. Part two of this is if I do get that flat file down, I want to build better muscle memory about the challenges in that data. And I want to learn why those challenges existed and and hypothesize how I'm going to build reports and visuals off this stuff and then know or learn how to clean it in a way that's more efficient. Because the next time I actually have a workspace thing that I need to go get some data and clean it, I'll feel much more capable in Power Query. So I'm, I'm intentionally forcing myself to try and use Power Query as much as I physically possibly can and almost touch no files ever as much as I possibly can. So those are my two kind of nuggets. There. I don't know what, if that even answered your question. I just started rambling. No, I, I love that. I think what, what I'm hearing, my my opinion here is you got to be committed. Um, you got to be committed to what you're trying to achieve with that sample database rather than going exploratory. That's true. Um, and I agree with that. I, I was dealing with the YouTube API and in order to pull paginated, there is no such, like it basically calls a token on the end of each page. Yep. Which means you can't. And I remember that idea. I'm like, I don't know how long this is going to take me to figure out but I have to figure this out. Yep. It's and, that, middle, that little hurdle. Right. And it was hours, but then I feel like you're figuring out more about Power Query. But you, I think for me, that success factor is whatever sample data set or whatever you're learning by doing, mm -hmm. you got to be committed to the solution. 
that yeah. you, you initially set out. So that's my my side. Seth, do you have anything in terms of what success I, I, factors? Yeah, I honestly wouldn't change anything outside of like the third part of his second blog, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. T- his tips for successful personal data project, like it's making it meaningful. Like pick a main question. If the main question is like that assumption where you were like, oh yeah, it didn't 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 do anything, you can pick another one, right? Yeah. Like there's yeah. there's yeah. always multiple different things that you can you have an interest in in um trying to make better actionable something that is going to create meaning and i think that's where personal data sets are really fun because the impact to your life whether it be health or um you know family time or you know you traveling or whatever the case may be right like those data sets are designed to have an impact on your own life and create action in your own. So I think he lays out a a great like lit litany litany of questions uh, oh, or this is like statements. a word challenge are we playing scrabble I know, like, right the <laughs> what the heck disillusionment where, litany i don't where, even google all these words you know, today it's, it's like personal Africa things are your own thing right do your own thing but make it meaningful make like to your point tommy um the more it could potentially mean something to me the further i'm gonna go to try to answer the question from a technical perspective, yeah. right? Whether it's like, I don't have the data pieces, I'm gonna go to the umpteenth level to get them because this is gonna answer that question. And that's the drive I think that is sometimes required by us to solve the problem that inherently in business, we have a lot of pressure put on us to to solve, which is why we solve them. But if you have a meaningful thing in a personal data set, it, it, it acts like that driver to solve the issue as opposed to just being like, eh, you know, that was fun. <laughs> and then just leave Moving it. on. Right. Yeah. 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 I like that. And I think, I think another one that I'll point out here based on Kurt's list here, don't bite off more than you can chew. I've definitely mm-hmm. gotten places where I've started <laughs> data set things. And I thought, man, back. I was going to, I was like, man, I would love Legos. I'm going to go suck out all the data from the Lego database. <laughs> and I'm going to have this great rich Lego database. And I'm like, this is way too much for me to chew <laughs> off. And I got stuck. So I was like, mm, no, thanks. So I, I, but I would also say too, to that end, don't be afraid. So I like your point, Seth. Before you start, come out with a single question or two that you can at least try to get to as best you can, but don't be afraid to shelf it. So mm. you will likely lose interest at some point in some of those personal projects at some point. And unless you're trying to like really test out like a new feature. And one of the challenges I found when I was first doing the Power BI Tips blog, I continually made my own data sets oh, every single time. And at some point, you get to a point where like, I don't want to re-engineer the data yet again for yet another test. I want to have something that's just static. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I literally just want to show up and start playing with visuals. So one thing that I've done personally is I actually, I went into, when you go into Power BI Desktop, you can try a sample piece of data, which is an Excel file that ships with Power BI Desktop. You can load that Excel file as a sample data set. And what I did is I made a read-only Power BI file that I call the star model. I've taken the single flat table, I've gone into Power Query, and I've made all the dimensions that I would need off of that single data set. And so I have a true fact table, nothing but keys and numbers. And then I have a handful of dimension tables. So it's it's pure star schema. I use it in demos all the time. And it's a read-only file. And I pin it. I pin that file to my Power BI desktop. So that way, when I need to go open a file, I can click open and right there at the top of my list is star model. And then I have a two star model because I have two fact table, two fact star is another one I have, same thing. But I made it very simple so I could just open the file up, no data engineering, I already know the facts and dimensions and I can start testing or building something that can test a theory or hypothesis. So I I do Mm. that a lot as well. So when you find a personal data set that you like, or you have found some data engineering that you've done, think about how you could reuse it to test something quickly next time, because now you've already designed the data set that's easy for you to understand and you know it. Yeah. So reuse it. It's a great, great idea. No, I, I love that. And because a lot of times we talk about a lot about the modeling, but just also some new feature comes out or like, what about a scorecard? What could I do here? And quickly get into that is huge. Yeah. So Awesome. Well, I, uh, I think we've done another really great episode here. We're going to call this one a little bit short uh, because, you know, kids, 
things evenings uh so that being said uh thank you all very much yeah in the mornings uh all that being said uh, thank you very much for listening to the episode. Hope you found some good information about this. The links for these two articles, which I highly recommend everyone read. These are well-written, engaging, uh, very thoughtful. You, uh, Kurt put a lot of thought into this. I can definitely tell he put some good uh, thoughts into what's going on here. So I really enjoy them. So highly recommend the read there. Uh, I only ask you as listeners, we love your your listenership. We appreciate you being here even when we're not. And so we would love for you to uh, like and subscribe on YouTube if you don't mind. Uh, give us a thumbs up. It really helps let other people know this is good content that you're enjoying. Uh, but in addition to that, please, if you don't mind, share it with somebody else. Share it with on your social media or let someone else know that you found some value from this content. And um, we really appreciate that and appreciate your time. Tommy, where else can you find the podcast? You can find the podcast anywhere they're available. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment and a rating on those podcast platforms. If you want to join the conversation live, you can do so every Tuesday and Thursday, 7.30 a.m. Central. Follow Power BI Tips on YouTube. Awesome. Well, thank you all very much. We really appreciate your time, and we'll see you next time.